are live from Bloomberg's headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, Gemini is eliminating another 10% of its workforce as the bankruptcy of Genesis intensifies the public fight between the Winklevoss twins and Barry Silbert. $3.4 billion. That's how much Genesis owes its top 50 creditors. As the firm races to strike a deal, we'll speak with Matt Siegel of Vanek, which is among the biggest Genesis creditors. And Bitcoin continues to rally even as crypto lending teeters on the brink of extinction. Can the industry and can the asset withstand this latest blow? John Wu of Ava Labs weighs in. All right, so all of that is ahead, but first let's get a snapshot of the market. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. And what you will find is that Bitcoin's rally is taking a bit of a break today. We're down about four tenths of 1%, just shy of $23,000. But remember, at the beginning of January, we were trading down around $16,500. So this rally has been remarkable, even if it isn't continuing on this Tuesday. Ether also down about 1% around the 1600 level. What's outperforming today includes Binance coins. BNB is up about uh, 1%. We're going to have more on Binance and the issue of storing collateral along with customer funds uh, later on in the show. And Kronos up about 3% as well, Matt. All right, so the question a lot of people have been asking, what's driving this rally? And there are a number of things we'll discuss throughout the program with our guests, including Matthew Siegel. But one of the other things that we noticed is the RSI has shot up to the highest level that we've seen it in over two years. And that has been behind the drive to 23,000. There are laundry, laundry list of risks, though, that remain on the horizon to challenge the sanguine investor sentiment. Bloomberg Shanali Basic is here with the latest. Shanali? Yeah, Matt, we have to look at the digital currency group empire because within that empire, the question of Genesis has both money and jobs on the line. Gen Gemini Trust Company, the firm founded by the billionaire Winklevoss twins, is cutting another 10% of its workforce, adding to the wave of job cuts across the technology, fintech, and crypto industries at large. Now remember, the Winklevoss brothers have been waging a public fight against Genesis, even calling for Barry Silbert, the founder of the digital currency group Empire, to step down as its CEO. As Genesis's lending business entered bankruptcy, Gemini has been listed as its largest outside creditor, with the most money owed by a landslide. The Gemini earned business has 340,000 customers of its own, uh, 340,000 customers of its own, and their withdrawals have been halted since November. Both of these companies are now under scrutiny of the S by the SEC, with a lawsuit already against them. The question is how Gemini will get its money back. Genesis lawyers are saying they're working around the clock to reach a deal with the largest creditors, but there are complications. Gemini's borrowings were in part secured by shares of Grayscale's Bitcoin Trust, shares that were ultimately sold. The Genesis business disputes whether those sales satisfied agreements between the companies. Now, when Genesis Capital filed for Chapter 11 protections, Cameron Winklevoss hinted at future legal fights without a fair offer for creditors, saying that Barry Silbert and Digital Currency Group are not insulated from accountability. Also remember that Silbert's Digital Currency Group is a huge creditor to Genesis as well. Genesis has a special committee on its board that's investigating the intercompany loan that includes a $1.65 billion loan to Silbert's DCG. Remember, Bloomberg has also previously reported that authorities are separately investigating intercompany loans, and certainly Gemini is not the only counterparty concerned about getting its funds back. The Gemini and Genesis job cuts are early signs of stresses throughout the Genesis capital bankruptcy. But as we've seen before, this industry, one bankruptcy has often led to another. All right, Shanali, thanks very much for that. Shanali Basic talking about the headwinds that face Bitcoin and crypto. Joining us to talk more about this is Matthew Siegel, Van Eck, head of digital assets research. Van Eck's new finance income fund is listed among the top 50 Genesis creditors, with Genesis owing Van Eck $53 million. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the, the program. Um, before we get to Van, Eck, to Van Eck and Genesis, I want to just get your thoughts on the underlying asset, right? There's been a huge run up in um, the price of Bitcoin, and I get that it could be partially the dollar. Maybe people think the Fed's done. The economy is doing better than expected. What do you think's behind the run up? Yeah, I think there's a number of factors that have led to an incredibly strong start to the year. Bitcoin was up 16 out of the first 18 trading days of the year. Um, 
the most important is that global money supply growth bottomed in December. So we don't see that in the U.S. where M2 growth is zero, but in the rest of the world, it started to reaccelerate, and historically, that's been an excellent indicator for a Bitcoin bottom. That happened in early December. We're also seeing a strengthening Chinese RMB. Historically, that has also been very positive for the Bitcoin price. Uh, the Fed funds price simply bottomed in December as well. We saw the same thing happen in 2018. Fed funds price bottomed shortly after Bitcoin did as well. Uh, we've got a debt ceiling debate going on. U.S. CDS yes. spreads are at their highest since 2011. Uh, we would expect that issue to raise its head over the next number of quarters and years and to be a tailwind for Bitcoin. Um, so I think those are some of the factors, a slightly different macro tape, a better outlook for inflation. What's amazed me, and Kaylee and I wake up every morning at 2 or 3 and check the Bitcoin price, shocked that it's not getting destroyed by the implosion of FTX and now um, the bankruptcy of Genesis. Why do you think it's able to weather these kinds of crises? I think that you checking it at 3 a.m. is a good clue, because if you look at the price action of Bitcoin year to date, we've seen remarkable strength during the Asian trading hours. That's where the bulk of the gains have come. Negative returns in the U.S. Uh, sorry, negative returns in, U in Europe, flattish returns in the U.S. So I think sometimes U.S.-based investors will over-index to regulatory issues or SEC headlines, and what they're missing is the big picture, which is emerging markets looking to stable coins, looking to Bitcoin as a neutral uh, way to transact value without intermediaries. Interesting. All right. I'd like to return to the Genesis issue because, as Matt mentioned, one of the top 10, ten creditors is Vanek, $53 million. How confident are you in a recovery of that? So first I want to say that the creditor is the Vanek New Finance Income Fund, uh, which is a, a private fund open only to institutional investors. So even if these uh, were securities, uh, our fund is, is unaffected. Uh, it's in the bankruptcy filings that, that that fund is, I think, the number 11 creditor to Genesis. Um, you know, some bankruptcies result in no recovery for creditors. Some bankruptcies can result in a full recovery for creditors. Uh, we see substantial assets at DCG. We hope and expect that DCG is going to kick in. Uh, and uh, we see the possibility for a full recovery. Uh, if you look at the public filings in the day one bankruptcy hearings, uh, it's disclosed that there are more than 10 iterations of term sheets that are going back and forth right now. Uh, so there are active negotiations. We think there's a strong possibility for a full recovery. Look forward to working with the U.S. T trustee, DCG, Genesis, and the other creditors to affect that. Well, Shanali mentioned this kind of issue of intercompany loans, how we're talking about a conglomerate here, and it all gets very messy with these different parts. From just kind of a digital assets research perspective, how has this changed the lens through which you view massive players like this and the kind of business that should be done with them? Well, I, th I think one of the reasons that we've gotten into this bankruptcy is that the SEC didn't approve a Bitcoin spot ETF, right? And instead, folks were ripping around this illiquid uh, GBTC entity at yeah. wide premiums and wide discounts and without uh, a liquid instrument that trades at NAV. Um, you're going to get into these types of messy situations. Uh, so that's, that's one thing we, should, we could take from this, is that an ETF might have prevented this. Uh, the other thing is that the U.S. trustee will have uh, extraordinary uh, oversight into the bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, the judge you know, will be able to circumvent a lot of normal processes. And that might be something that uh, you know, Genesis and DCG would want to avoid, and that's why there's a lot of active negotiations. I mean, commingling of funds. The term commingling has become a watchword, right? Um, do you think that's what was happening here? Do you think there's a fraud? Uh, there were clearly interparty transactions and loans that were not well understood by the various stakeholders. Uh, and we'll see what the courts have to say about that. So there's multiple entities that will likely file suit. The Winklevoss brothers have said their theirs is pending. Uh, Firtree has one. So we'll see if the court forces disclosure uh, of all this and what that means for legal ramifications. But the short order uh, is that there's substantial assets at DCG. Uh, we hope and expect that them that Barry Silbert has the money. You need him to step up to the plate.
Yes. Very well. Well, Matt kind of alluded to this already, the idea that this sh in some ways we thought may be an earth shattering event and it just simply was it when when it comes to the assets that we're talking about. Are there other if this was not it potential negative catalysts that you could see coming down the line? How many more shoes need to drop in order for it to actually have a material negative impact? On the Bitcoin price. So uh, last December, we put out a forecast for this year. Uh, we identified four negative catalysts that might uh, cause a, a weak Q1. Uh, one of those catalysts was a disorderly DCG bankruptcy, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, we got a rather self contained a Genesis, Genesis bankruptcy yeah. and what looks to be like uh, possibly constructive negotiations to resolve that. So I would say that that is a removal. Uh, tentative removal of one of the worst catalysts. Uh, the other was the potential that Cephas was going to block Binance US's acquisition of the $1 billion of Voyager assets. That deal was permitted to go through. So these are two negative catalysts where the worst case was averted. Uh, there's a possibility for two more negative catalysts. Uh, you know, hot inflation prints would obviously be negative for the Bitcoin price, uh, as would a, a Ripple loss. So the SEC and Ripple expected to have a decision by the end of Q1. Um, that, that would be a potential negative catalyst. But Bitcoin shrugging that off. It's been a great start to the year. <laughs> Matt Siegel, thanks so much for coming in. One of the most considered intelligent voices in finance on uh, crypto. So we're glad to have you here. Matt Siegel there of Van Eck. Now, coming up, John Wu joins us, the president of Ava Labs. Looking forward to that conversation. Plus, the Ethereum co-founder wants to create a more private transaction system with, quote, stealth addresses. More on that ahead. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. I actually think Genesis is a bigger issue in terms of the capital markets of crypto than even FTX. Genesis was the largest lender out there. They, they've done unsecure as well as collateralized lending. There's really no one else doing that lending. They, without them in the markets, all the people in the value chain, all the companies like market makers who need to borrow in order to do market making, you're going to see liquidity get sapped out of the markets, spreads widen, no investors want to come in, and you have a vicious cycle. So Genesis is a very important part of the crypto capital markets. That was Ava Labs President John Wu speaking on Bloomberg back in November. And guess who's back? John Wu, I'm pleased to say, is with us now here on set in New York uh, at our studios here. So that was November when we were still waiting for the domino to fall. It now has. Mm -hmm. Has it had the ramifications that you initially thought it would? So I think I heard your earlier guess on a price perspective. We've seen things stabilize and actually bounce a little bit. But underneath the hood, it's not as clean as people think it is. Um, we saw the earlier crises like FTX and Alameda take the leverage out of the system, but the market is not as healthy as people would think in terms of a depth perspective. Slippage when people make trades, number of participants in the market have all um, decreased. In fact, a hedge fund uh, friend of mine who was in crypto yesterday tried to do some arbitrage and he couldn't find the other side or the spreads were so wide they couldn't transact. So even though the prices are better, underneath the hood, it's not as good as people think it is. OK, so if it's messier than what we're seeing on the surface level, is it just going to continue to get messier? Genesis was basically the gatekeeper between lenders and borrowers who couldn't face themselves in, uh, to face each other because of regulation, because of dis, uh, different geographies. And they took some risk to doing that. Maybe they made the wrong prices for the lenders and the borrowers. So ultimately what you need is new people to replace that liquidity provider. Genesis, I, I'd say in traditional finance, is more like uh, almost like a, a repo credit facility, allowing things to happen before things actually settled. For real institutions to come back into this market, new money to come in, you need the replacement of these old uh, uh, players like Genesis or FTX, Alameda to come in. What I don't understand is, and you spent time not only in the crypto industry, but on Wall Street as well, um, Genesis is just a small piece of the big uh, multi-billion dollar DCG empire, right? Barry Silbert is a very wealthy man with a very wealthy business. Why don't they backstop Genesis instead of, you know, leaving um, the, the Winklevoss twins, for example, and everybody at Gemini short, you know, so much money. 
I think from a uh, philosophical perspective, Barry being in here so early into this space and as a leader in the space should help out. From a legal perspective, this is why you have separate entities. Um, so from a legal perspective, it's different. Unless we could figure out a way to pierce that corporate veil, he, he doesn't have that obligation probably. But from a leader in this space, I think he does have some obligation to help out and make individuals, customers whole. I want to talk about, I want to switch gears for a second and talk about the business of crypto and what it can actually do to, you know, better society, to create profits, to help people in everyday life. And you're doing that at AVA, which mm -hmm. I think is so interesting. Talk to us about what you're doing with traditional companies like Shopify. I guess, you know, they're new internet companies, but they're Web 2, not Web 3, right? right. Um, Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. What are you doing with these companies to actually put the blockchain to work in, in the real economy? Great, so putting the crypto capital markets aside for a second, as an operator in this space, one of our goals is to bring the next billion users into crypto or blockchain. Bring the next trillion dollars from traditional finance onto blockchain. And you need partnerships with Shopify as well as AWS. The AWS partnership is a fantastic partnership. It benefits both us and AWS. In fact, Amazon is actually uh, dedicating a lot of resources, people, tech, money, to help Ava Labs, Ava Lanch. In the end, it's a win-win for developers in the space, for customers of uh, AWS who want to deploy on blockchain, and obviously great distribution for Ava Labs and Ava Lanch. I'm wondering how the tenor of those conversations with potential corporate partners, though, may have changed considering those who are more literate in the crypto and blockchain world, I guess, understand that there is a difference between Bitcoin and underlying blockchain mm. technology. But in kind of common thought and in the court of popular opinion, those things tend to get conflated. How difficult is it to have those conversations with non-digital asset native companies? That's a great question. Um, the non So each one is different. Mm. Amazon is hearing their customers, their developers, their startups want to deploy them Web3 or blockchain, and they want Avalanche. Shopify, their merchants, they want to create loyalty programs with NFTs. So this is all end market driven, as opposed to here's some ocean, let's go boil it together. There's you know, there's a lot of talk about Web3, there's a lot of talk about DLT, there's a lot of talk about the tokenization of assets. And this is what I think Wall Street, what guys like you came over to crypto to do. Um, how do you see that moving forward in a tangible way? And I'm thinking about tokenization specifically because it's happening. Yeah, it's absolutely happening. Tokenization of real world assets, both financial and non-financial, is happening. Um, let's not forget that JP Morgan and their private blockchain has already transacted over $400 billion uh, through tokenized currencies as well as tokenized fixed income products. Uh, Ava Labs had a, a tokenized part of a KKR fund, Apollo's creating a tokenized um, fund. So it's because it's very simple. It's more efficient and a more elegant solution. It's easier to issue, to transfer, to own, and to have transparency and tracking of those assets. Uh, in the blockchain system than in the traditional financial system. We just need to all wrap our heads around it because these terms, these phrases, I think confuse people. But if I tried to figure out how a cell phone works, <laughs> I would have no idea. Obviously, I still use the technology. Ultimately, it's very simple. It's going to help their bottom line and hopefully give them new customers. And that's the bottom line to all of these businesses. John, great having you in the studio. Thanks so much for joining us. Ava Labs President John Wu talking to us about crypto. All right, and for more talk about crypto, make sure to check out our Bloomberg Crypto Podcast, which dives deeper than the daily market buzz to explore the stories and people shaping the ever-evolving digital landscape. Look for that every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines. Let's get to some of the crypto stories that caught our attention this week. Binance has been mistakenly keeping collateral for some of the tokens it issues in the same wallet as exchange customers' funds. According to listings on its website, reserves for almost half of Binance PEG tokens, or B tokens, are currently stored in a single wallet called Binance 8, which also holds customer funds. The company said it is aware of the mistake and is in the process of correcting it. 
One of Ethereum's co-founders is proposing a more private transaction system. The new idea from Vitalik Buterin would allow Ethereum's users to generate stealth addresses where they can conduct private transactions with a special code. It comes as regulators are ramping up scrutiny on obscure transactions on a number of blockchain-based platforms. And even some of the smallest and riskiest tokens in the world have gotten swept up in the crypto price rebound. So-called SAM coins, such as FTT, Solana, and Serum, sank last year, obviously, because of their dependence on discredited mogul Sam Bankman-Fried. Now they're rallying, with some more than doubling just this month, and actually running up higher than Bitcoin, yeah. which I guess makes sense because it's a much bigger token, so it isn't as volatile, but still pretty crazy. Yeah, and it begs the question, why? I love the quote in the story on the Bloomberg Terminal from one analyst over at Crypto Compare, Jacob J Joseph, who says, these tokens are not likely to have any fundamental value. It's all just arbitrary and kind of animal spirit behavior that we had said goodbye to in 2022. So much of that more speculative behavior was choked off, and now it seems to have come roaring back. Yeah, I think... Uh, speculation is not dead in these markets. A lot of people would argue that's the only thing that uh, holds crypto assets up. We uh, don't necessarily agree with that, right? We were just talking about some of the practical applications of crypto, but it doesn't seem like there are going to be any for Serum or FTT. At least none that we can foresee as of yet. But it speaks more broadly to what we were just discussing, frankly, both with John and Matthew, this idea that you would have thought that given the ripple effects, how many different implosions we have seen of players in the crypto industry, that it would have had more of an effect on some of these underlying assets, like the price of Bitcoin. And instead, it's moved in the exact opposite way that many of us has, have in, had anticipated. So it begs the question of how much of that is more about the macro story, the idea that if things have gotten easier in terms of monetary policy or even the economy, that that is filtering through to these non-traditional assets in kind of a traditional way. I thought it was really interesting what Matt Siegel um, told us as far as the regional breakdown of price action. Yeah. Right. During the Asian session, Bitcoin tends to rally or crypto assets, he said, tend to rally. Um, not so much in the European session and in the U.S. session, they retract a little bit because we're so focused here on regulation and SEC yeah. headlines that we're not really seeing the bigger picture. At least that's what he said. Well, we get to see the bigger picture because we're always up early every single day when all of that action is happening. We're also always here on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time for Bloomberg Crypto. So make sure to tune in next week. The CoinShares CEO will be joining us. And on the subject of regulation, which Matt just mentioned, Representative French Hill, the chair of the House Subcommittee on Digital Assets, Financial Technology and Inclusion, Fun will be joining fun. us. Don't miss it. This is Bloomberg.